Pastor Miles on last Sunday for uh, pinch hitting for us. And also, uh, we want to thank uh, Pastor Mac for pinch hitting for us also. And so we just, let's give those two guys a hand. They did a good job. One thing about it, we got some guys that are capable of uh, delivering God's word. They have their own personalities, and that's good. They have their own way of delivery, that's good. But we all have the same spirit, and that's even greater, okay? And as you know, the month of July, I'm out. I'm gone for the whole month of July, so we'll have five of our finest, okay, elders that will be filling this slot uh, for the five Sundays in July. And I'm excited. What I do is I get the, the tapes, the videotapes, and I, I watch them and I listen to them, and I get fed that way. And that's the way I can support them, although I'm not here, but I still can support them by listening to the word that God has put in each one of their hearts. And so I'm excited about that. It's a blessing to have guys that you don't have to worry about what they're going to say when they get up here. You know, they have to be looking over your shoulder. And when you come back, you don't have to straighten out a whole bunch of stuff because of error. And so that's a blessing. Uh, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to try to get through chapter 4. Try to finish, finish up chapter 4 in the book of Ecclesiastes. In the book of Ecclesiastes, we're going to try to finish up chapter 4. But if not, we're not in a hurry. If not, we're not in any hurry, okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 4. That's where we left off the last time that we were here. Now we need to start reading at verse 1 for context to get us down to verse 4 where we'll pick up at. Verse 4 chapter 1 says, Again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. In other words, they don't have anybody to come to their rescue. They don't have anybody to be an advocate for them. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. In other words, they have ultimate power that rests in the political process. And the everyday common man doesn't have any power or say so. They think they do, but they really don't. We, vote these guys and we put them in office and they're supposed to be representing us. But let's face it, they're really not. They're really representing certain interest groups that help put them there, okay? And so therefore, just the everyday common man, he really doesn't have an advocate or a voice of anybody to speak for him on his behalf. And then verse two says, and I declare that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. Well, think about when you're dead, you don't have to worry about being oppressed anymore because the scripture declares that once you're dead, all thoughts ceased, all production ceased, okay? Everything that you do or have done while you're here on this earth, guess what? It ceased, it's, it's no more. You don't have to worry about the oppressor or being oppressed or being comforted because it's all over with. Look what else he says. He says, verse three, he said, but better than both, is he who has not yet been born, or rather he who has not yet been, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. He says even better than dying, it's better than not have been born. Because once you're born, guess what? You're gonna, you're gonna experience some kind of trial and tribulation or some kind of problems, okay? Or they say, isn't it a shame that child died at two years old? Well, is this really a shame? Is that really bad? That the child died at two years old or one month old or died at birth? Is that really bad? That's what Solomon said. Solomon said, really, they didn't have to deal with any of this stuff. The younger person dies, guess what? The less turmoil and the less oppression and the less pain and suffering he really has to deal with, okay? So Solomon saying death, a premature death, is really not a bad thing, okay? As it relates to doing what? Being oppressed or being treated fairly in this world, okay? Now we get to verse 4. He says, And I saw that all labor and all achievement sprang from man's envy of his neighbor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. In other words, he's saying that if you're focused, and we heard Misha ask a prayer request for a promotion. He's saying if, if Misha is asking for that promotion to do what? So she, because she's envious or jealous of somebody else in the department. And she want to get what they got, and she want to be where they are. He says, man, that's, 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 that's vain. That's meaningless. 
It's meaningless, okay? Advancement and promotion, he says, if you're doing what? To get even, or to try to do what? Keep up with the Joneses, or be as good as somebody, or prove a point. He says, that's meaningless. Let me say this. I like to use personal examples. I can say that truly I've never tried to be promoted. I've never tried to be advanced. I've never tried to get a position. God has blessed me, glory, in everything that in my whole life, okay? I just worked. And as a result, my work, guess what? I just got promoted. Without me even asking for it, me even striving for it, it just happened, okay? That's just the way it is. All the awards and all the accolades I got, I never tried, Lawrence, to get into those awards, accolades, guess what? As a result of good work ethics, guess what? Those things were just a byproduct of that, okay? And so we're going to be praying for Misha. Uh, we know she's doing it with the right spirit, okay, that for her promotion, okay? And then ver- verse 5, I like verse 5. It says, the fool holds his hand and ruins himself. The fool holds his hands and ruins himself. In other words, if you're lazy and don't put your hand to the plow, guess what? You're going to end up being poor. Now, Paul, do we have our scriptures up? Okay, could we put up Proverbs uh, chapter 6? Verses 6 to 11, and he clears that, it's 10, 18. It addresses what happens when you have lazy hands, okay? And we have a society, we was talking about it yesterday, uh, after we went out to uh, pass out flyers and sign people up at Big Age Bible School, we were sitting uh, in that fellowship hall eating Chick-fil-A, okay, and cookies and stuff like that, and chips, had a good time. And we were talking about the fact that these people that are doing what? Putting themselves on these pills so that they could be classified as being depressed, and they stay on these pills the rest of their lives, and all they get is five, six hundred dollars a month. That's what he's talking about. If you do what? If you put your hand, if you just fold your hand and just do what? Take a pill so that when you go to the rehab center and they check you out, that, that medication is in your system so that you can still qualify for being depressed. He said, you're going to turn the road. You always do what? Be in poverty. You'll always be in poverty. Why? If you're making five or six hundred dollars a month, that means guess what? You can't move the way you want to move to. You have to stay where they put you in a section eight or whatever the case may be. You'll never be able to own a car. Okay? You'll have to do what? You'll always be stuck with a bus pass. You'll always be what? On food stamps. Think about this. You'll always what? Be in poverty. Because you chose not to do what? Work. You'd rather what? Fold your hand and take a pill and stay on the system the rest of your life. That's vanity. Matter of fact, that's insanity. That's insanity. Proverbs, okay? It says, go to the ancient sluggard, consider his ways and be wise. It has no commander, nor will see a ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Of course, the ant don't even need anybody to tell them. They don't even have anybody over them. They don't have a boss. Ants are just ants, okay? You see a collar of ants, there's a whole bunch of them, millions of little boogers, okay? They don't have anybody to tell them what to do. They got enough sense to do what? If we don't eat, guess what? We're going to starve to death. And so they're what? They, they, they get up their food in the summertime, and in the wintertime, you don't see ants. What are they doing? Eating the food that they gathered up in the summertime, okay? They got enough sense to do that. So it says, guess what? You ought, as a human being, you ought to have enough sense as an ant. An ant can't even think. As a human being, you ought to do what? Have enough sense and enough get up about yourself to at least do what? Go out and, at harvest time, do what? Get you a job so you can do what? Have something to eat, have some resources. Okay? And then the next verse says what? It says, how long will you live, lie there, you sluggard, when you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. He just stay there. And let me, let me say this. Let me say this. Those people that are on those pills, guess what? That's all they do all day long. They lay around. They sleep and they slumber. They watch the soaps, play dominoes, okay? And then guess what? They go down to the center where they have required classes for them to take with their bus pass, okay? And then they go to the food stamp out. They go back and do what? They eat and they sleep and do the same thing over and over again. As a result, the Bible says, it's just like an armed man coming, stick them up. Unexpectedly, guess what? Now they're what? They're in poverty the rest of their lives. 
A little sleep, a little slumber. Check them out. You watch them. That's the characteristic. All they do is just lay around. They have no life. That's sad. We talking about healthy people. Now we're not talking about people. Now don't get me wrong. I'm compassionate. I'm not talking about people that are truly disabled, and they cannot work. Okay, or they have some kind of mental dis. I mean, legitimate mental disability that allows them not to be able to function in society where they can get a, a job. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what lazy folk. Okay, they don't want to do what. Don't want to put their hands to work. They say, "What? Well, I don't want to work at McDonald's." Well, duh. Did you not know? Let, let's, let's multiply it out. I'm not, I'm not a mathematician. Okay, so McDonald's make what? $7 an hour. So they work eight hours a day, right? How many dollars is that a day? Seven times eight is how much? 56. Okay, multiply times five is how much? This is round it off. $50 multiplied times, times the five is what? $250 a month, right? A week, right? And you multiply it times four is what? That's $1,000, right? That's $600 more than what you'll be getting. Plus, you get a free Big Mac, okay? Come on. You do the math on that. And you might get some overtime, okay? And you're probably going to get a raise, okay? Come on. If you got five, five, five weeks, guess what? You get an extra 250 Now you got 1250 okay? Come on. They ain't got enough sense to, man, this don't figure out. If I don't do anything, guess what? I'm going to starve to death. And you know who I blame? The government. For allowing what? This to go on. That's what I blame the government for allowing it to happen. Because they actually do what? They actually do what? Make them codependent and they actually encourage it. You know what they tell them? If the pills are not in your system, you get cut off. So they're encouraging them to do what? To be drug addicts. Legal drug addicts. Come on, what kind of society is this? What's the next scripture say? It says, through laziness, the rafters sag because of the idle hands the house leaks. If you don't do nothing to your house, guess what? It's going to fall in on you. You don't maintain your car, guess what? It's going to quit running. You don't maintain your body, guess what? It's going to shut down on you. If you don't keep your mind active, guess what? It's going to become idle. And go on and on and on, okay? Laziness. Matter of fact, the Bible what? detests laziness. God designed man to work, not to be on the system, not to be lazy, okay? Look what else he says. I know y'all don't like this, but it's the truth. <laughs> verse 7. <laughs> I mean, verse 6 is just the opposite. Look what verse 6 says. It says, better one handful with tranquility than two handful with toil and chasing after the wind. In other words, it's better to do what? Have a little and be happy and have what? Tranquility of mind than to have a lot and be unhappy. Can I, can I say that again? He's saying it's better to do what? Have a little, have one handful of happiness, guess what, rather than have two handful of hell. And we're going to talk about some folks that we know that have been that way in a minute, okay? But let's look at that scripture. What did that scripture say? You got the scripture, Paul? Okay, it says, two things I ask of you, Lord, do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal, and so dishonor the name of my God. In other words, they say, I don't want to be rich, and I don't want to be poor. Right. I really have what? Just enough yeah. for my daily needs, yeah. so therefore I want to do what? I want to get puffed up and disown you if I get rich, or if I get poor, I'm caught in a situation where I got to steal something and still dishonor or disown your name. I mean, how much do you need? Think about it. How much food do you need? I mean, how much do you really need? Okay? How big a car do you really need? How big a house do you really need? How big a bathroom do you really need? How big a bed do you need? Okay? I mean, think about it. How, how much is enough? All you need is what? Enough space in the bed to be able to lie down. 
you can't lay across the whole bed unless you do it this way, okay? And most folks don't lay that way, okay? Because you got your wife, or whatever case may be. Right? In a seat, all you need is what? Just enough room to fit your bottom, okay? In a car, all you need is what? Just a car big enough to get you what? From A point A to point B. In a house, guess what? If you got 20 rooms, you can only do what? Live in one room at a time. You are not omnipresent like God. You can't be everywhere at one time. You can only be in one room at a time, okay? How much money do you need in the bank? It's there, right? But money really is not any good unless you do what? Take it and use it for something else, okay? And so, therefore, when we start talking about riches, it's not an honor to be poor. And poor, poor just because you're poor don't mean you're happy either. Let's get that straight. So when I start my dialogue here, I want you to understand that all rich folk are not unhappy. All poor folk ain't happy either. <laughs> so God doesn't favor one over the other, okay? Now, let's look at some folk, okay, that has a lot, okay? But guess what? They're in turmoil. Well, let's start with Muhammad Ali. He died. He's the reason why he died. Let's look at some, some celebrities, some icons, okay? Icon is a one of a kind, okay? That's what the word icon is. Look at, look at Muhammad Ali. He said he what? He said he, he said he was the greatest. And the world said what? He was the greatest. But you know what? You know what happened to Muhammad Ali? In 1964, he converted. No. Change that word. You can't convert from Christianity to nothing, because that means you never was saved. You can't convert from Islam to Christianity, because that means now you're saved. So he did what? He never was saved, but he did what? He joined the Muslims under Elijah Muhammad, and he changed his name. So the greatest man in the world, guess what? The Bible says, you know where Muhammad is right now? He right now is in hell, and the Bible says, the great and the small will stand before God at the great white throne judgment. So the greatest man, Muhammad Ali, in the boxing world, guess what? When a great white throne judgment comes, he will be there. And he'll spend the rest of his life into the lake of the fire. They say he was worth $50 million when he died. He had riches. He had fame, but guess what? It's all vanity. Well, how about the next guy, Prince? They said Prince couldn't even sleep. He was worth three, he had what, two hands full. He, he was worth $300 million, and he couldn't even sleep. He died. And I understand that he was a Jehovah Witness or whatever case might be. Guess what? You know what Prince is? With the greatest boxer in the world, <laughs> the greatest song, songster in the world, guess what? He's right there with Muhammad. Well, let's take my boy Michael Jackson, okay? What about old Michael? Michael had two fists full. And he probably had a toes full. I mean, everything. I mean, he had it, okay? But he had a miserable life. From his childhood up, his dad was dominant. From his childhood, he never was happy. An eccentric, a weird fellow, okay? I understand he was a Jehovah's Witness. Guess what? You know where he is? The greatest. King of pop, guess where he is? He's with the king of boxing, okay? And the king of Prince, okay? They all what? In hell right now. But they had what? Two hands full. Well, let's look at another one. What I did was I went online and I Googled some unhappy rich folks. How about Howard Hughes? Y'all remember Howard Hughes? Now, he was a recluse. He was a weird guy. Matter of fact, they would say he was... He was so weird that when he died, they had to do it. They had to take his fingerprints to identify him because his hair was long, his skin was different. I mean, he, was, he had just had all these millions of dollars, had two hands full, but he was miserable. He had to what? Abandoned himself of all the people, had excluded himself from society. He lived a hermit's life. Died with all that money. Okay? Let's look at another one here. Marilyn Monroe, y'all remember her? Yeah. Unhappy, rich woman, okay? And then we have uh, Michael Douglas's uh, grandson, uh, Cameron Doug Douglas. He's in prison right now for drugs. Had all that money, okay? Charles Schwab, okay? He was the uh, president of Bethlehem Steel. 
died a very unhappy man, okay? Those are just some examples. You can go on and on and on. We're talking about icons. We're talking about people that had fistfuls of dollars, okay? They died, what? Unhappy because they lived an unhappy life because guess what? Riches cannot bring you happiness. We need to understand that. That's what Solomon, now Solomon was the richest man in the world, okay? He ought to know. Because guess what? At this point in time, guess what? His life was miserable also. And he knew that if you do what? Don't do anything, you're going to be poor. Okay? And if you try to do a get up a whole bunch of riches, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be happy. Or you're going to be able to enjoy life. We need to understand it, okay? Now, let's look at the next scripture. Uh, Philippians chapter, I mean Proverbs chapter 30, verse 75. We got that? He says what? I'm not saying this because I have a need, for I've learned to do what? Be content in what? Whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have, been learn, I have learned, rather, the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things to who? Through Christ who strengthens me. Brethren, sisters, that's the key. That's the key. It's not what you have, but who you have on the inside of you. Is the key, okay? And God says, the Bible says what? Christ became poor so that we could become rich. We're not talking about materialistic, you rich, all this going to vanish anyway. He says, so we can do what? Be rich spiritually, so in the absence of what? Material riches, we can still be content. Not happy, because happiness is based upon circumstances. If the Warriors win again Monday night, some folk going to be happy. If they lose, some folk going to be unhappy, okay? You got some unhappy Cleveland fans, right? Okay? <laughs> it's based upon circumstances, okay? So happiness is, guess what? It's not legitimate from a standpoint of emotion. Joy is what? In the spite of whether the, the Cleveland win or in spite of whether they war, it don't really matter, guess what? Because you still have what? Joy on the inside of your heart. You have peace of mind. Listen, you can't buy peace of mind. Did I tell you about Elvis Presley? Let me read somebody else's pressure right quick. Let's read Grace. Let's read about it. He's a king. Let's read about Elvis Presley, okay? Let's see if we got something here on Elvis Presley. He, uh, let me see if I write that down. I didn't bring it with me. But anyway, it is reported that from January, I mean, yeah, January of 1975 to August of 1977 when he died, his doctor had prescribed him 19,000 prescriptions for all kinds of drugs, you name them. All kinds of do it, relaxers and mind, all the drugs. 19,000 prescriptions. And when he died, his doctor had what? Got together in his bag over 800 drugs to take with him on tour. Of course, his doctor was under investigation, too, for doing what? Prescribing all of those as medication. They say he weighed over 250 pounds. It took a lot of guys to just get, lift him up off the ground and put him in. Matter of fact, they say he was black as this box right here when the paramedics got to it. They didn't recognize him. The king of what? Elvis Presley. King of rock and roll, okay? Very miserable. His whole life he was what? He was a drug addict. And he had to do what? Take all these medications to do what? Just to survive. No contentment. Paul says, guess what? I've learned how to, in the midst of abundance, and the lack of abundance, guess what? I've still, that's, that's, a, that's a learned process. It's something you have to do with experience and do it, and then learn how to be content with what you have. If I never get a promotion, guess what? I'm cool. If I never get a bigger, bigger house, I'm okay. If I never get another car, guess what? I'm okay. Because the idea here is what? Your contentment is what? It's not in things. And you don't do what? Let your circumstances control you. You control your circumstances by saying, I can do all things through Christ 
who strengthens me. Paul says, when I'm weak, guess what? That's when I'm the strongest. That's an oxymoron. I know that. Okay? How can you be weak and strong? Well, Paul says, my weakness does what? Just brings out the strength of Christ in me, because that means I've gotten out of the way and do what? And get back and let Christ do the work, because I realize, guess what? I can't handle this. Listen, brothers and sisters, when you get to the point where he says, I can't, Christ says, good, I can. Now, you ready to let me do this? Or are you going to continue to do it? Try to make this happen. That's what he's saying. Rather than me trying to do it, Irvin, and I know I'm limited in the flesh within my own limitations, I get out of the way, and guess what? Turn it over to the person that has no limitations. And that's why he says, when I'm weak, that's when I'm made strong. And then he says, guess what? I glory in my infirmity. Come on, man. You, you glory in your weakness? Yeah. He says, because I know, when, guess what? When I'm doing what? Going through all these trials and tribulations, I know, guess what? Christ is going to stand up and speak in and through me. He's going to strengthen me to be able to handle all of these things that the world is throwing at me. If you've never experienced any problems, guess what? You'll never experience the strength of Christ in dealing with those problems for you. Not helping you deal with them. Okay, but doing what? Dealing with those problems for you in every area of your life. Kids are going astray, guess what? You can't do nothing about it. Listen, when your kids get grown, or even before they get grown, you've done all you could in an imperfect way. There's no perfect parents, okay? Matter of fact, one fellow said, your children are your offsprings and not your choices. They make their own choices, okay? so you can't feel guilty for, for their choices, okay? You can't fix them. All you can do is what? Teach them, coach them, counsel with them. Guess what? And I found one thing, Mike, when they get old, guess what? You no longer parent them. You just do what? Come alongside and counsel with them as they seek advice from you. I had to learn that. I had to learn that. Okay? You can't force your kids to do what? Do anything. So you do what? You turn them over to Christ. You turn them over to God, okay? I've got a daughter. Been out of church for over a year and a half. Guess what? I turn over to God. I said, but at least do what? Let me bring the child. If you're so selfish, you don't want to be fed, guess what? Don't deprive the child. Let me bring the child. And she could send it to that. Okay? Pray for every day. But guess what? I'm done with worrying about whether she... That's you and the Lord. You ain't going to make me unhappy. I learned that. But I had to learn that, okay? I've learned to be content. Even what? With children that are rebellious towards the way that they have been raised. I learned to be content, Bud Miles. And you have to do what? You have to learn the same thing, Terrell. Otherwise, they'll drive you crazy. You have to learn that, Johnny. They'll drive you crazy because you'll be wanting for them something they don't want for themselves. They're content where they are. They're satisfied where they are. And you want them to be up here and they down here, they satisfied that. You try to do what? You let them stay where they are. Because guess what? They will drag you down there too. I'm going to tell you something. They will drag you down there too. Guess what? They will bury you and spend all your money that you left them. He died from a broken heart because his kids, blah, blah, blah. Duh. The kids don't have a broken heart. Guess what? They pass by the cats. Oh, daddy. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. They just waiting on the wheel to be red. <laughs> so you have to do it. Learn how to be content. The first thing you have to do is learn how to turn it over to God. That's where your contentment comes. The thing you can't do nothing about, guess what? You better turn it over to the person that can. And go on and do what? Live a life of joy and peace. And don't feel guilty. Listen, listen, listen to me. Listen to an old 73-year-old man. Be 74 in June, 16. Listen, don't feel guilty because your children didn't come, turn out the way that you thought they were going to turn out. And don't go try to do it. Listen, listen, listen. You young people, you young people. Don't go try to do it. If you mess it up, don't go try to compensate for it by giving them a lot of things and stuff. 
to make up for what you didn't do. You can't make up for what you didn't do. You did the best that you could based upon the knowledge that you had in raising your children. Worst thing you can do is go back into what? Try to lavish a whole bunch of stuff on them because you feel guilt if I did this, I did that. No, that's the way they were going to turn out. Because they made what? Their own choices. Don't lighten up on them. You them keep, keep whooping that butt. So I wish I'd start earlier. Well, you start now. <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. Okay? But don't feel guilty. It'll eat you up. It'll eat you up. I don't feel guilty about none of my children. Can I just be transparent this morning? I'm going to be that way anyway. My son, he was gay. Okay? Son was gay. Byron. Okay? For a season. And he went to Houston, and thank God he joined that church, and he did, the spirit of life. And guess what? The pastor and his wife, I, I, I pray for him every time, they would help, help turn his life around. Got married, got two great grandkids, okay? And for a season, Lawrence, I was feeling bad about that. Well, his mom died when he was five, and I was a rat. For those four years, I was single. You know, I took care of him, but I didn't, what, spend enough time with him, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And so I was feeling guilty, Michael about the fact that my son turned out to be gay. The Spirit said, what are you doing? You ain't gay. <laughs> you didn't have no gay gene. You didn't put him in a gay environment. Matter of fact, it was just opposite. He saw you with a bunch of women. So if anything, guess what? He should have been a whoremonger. If, if the example of what the environment was, you see what I'm saying, Raymond? Okay. He was, he, he was put in an environment where it wasn't gay, okay? I, I'm just trying to get you to think personally. See, I've been there and done that, okay? Been down that road. But thank God, but God, guess what? At an early age, God brought him out of that. Okay? God brought him out of that, and as a result, when he died, he had what? He was a he had a strong testimony. Some of y'all went to the funeral, okay, down in Houston. The church had a strong testimony about how great an asset he was to that local church and to the body of Christ, how, how well he was respected. Okay, he turned out okay at the end of the day. But I had to get, I had to get off the guilt trip. So wait a minute. I didn't contribute to that. That's something that he chose to go that way, okay? So listen, if, if you got some gay children, okay, don't feel bad about that. You don't condone it, but guess what? You still love that child. You see, Rochelle, I never could have brought him out of that because I was mad and angry because I know that, guess what? He wasn't raised that way, so God sent him away from me to some people that's going to love him, show compassion towards him in the condition that he was in to do what? Get him out of that state to where he became a viable member of society. I'm glad, guess what? That God sent him to Houston to sit under some people that, guess what? They didn't condone it, but they embraced him. And they brought him out of that. Don't feel guilty. Okay? Learn how to be content. The kids are who they are. And they make their own choices, okay? All right, let's move on. I know I'm not going to finish this. Verse 7, he says, And again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. Verse 8, there was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. We talked about Howard Hughes. He was a recluse, right? Why was it? He had millions and millions of dollars, okay? Matter of fact, at that time, he was probably the richest man in the world. But he what? He didn't have any friends. All that wealth he had, guess what? It was for naught, Michael. He was a recluse. He had to do what? He had excluded himself, secluded himself from society completely. That's the guy that this Solomon is talking about right here. What good is it? I don't have anybody. And when he died, he didn't even leave a will. But he had left a hand with him, and they still doing what? They still contesting that. His money was divided up. He didn't even have anybody close enough to him. Or he didn't have enough to do a stewardship about himself to even write out a will to say, here's where I want my 
proceeds of my estate to go. How sad. How sad, okay? Everybody needs somebody, okay? You need somebody to share it with. It's good to have a wife to do what? Be able to share your stuff with. It's good to have friends to be able to share your stuff with, okay? Just to do what? Store stuff up for yourself? That's vain. I mean, come on. It's to be shared. And look what else he says. Look what else he says. Verse 9 says what? Two are better than one. You need a friend. Listen, listen. You need a friend. Everybody needs a what? A friend. And your wife may be your best friend, but guess what? You need friends other than your wife. You need somebody to come alongside of you other than your wife to do what? Be your friend. Two is better than one. Look what else he says. Look what else he says. He says, because they have a good return for their work. In other words, if you got two people working, guess what? You're going to get more done. Now, of course, now Joyce says that, okay, I don't help around the house. So it's two people in the house, but Joyce says that principle don't work over here, okay? Because I do all the work, and he just sit back in his recliner, okay? Well, she's telling the truth, okay? She asked, he said, what do you do? Well, Michael, I have to drop my head and say, well, nothing. <laughs> she's right, you know. But see, Alexis, the reason I don't do it there because she has a certain way she wants to see things done. Amen. So, Gloria, rather than take out of her personality, I just let her be in her personality, okay? I don't want no conflict, Cynthia. Because if I put the dishes up, I ain't going to put them in the right place. You got to learn, man. Just let, let's let them do it, okay? She fusses while she do this, don't do nothing. She fusses, but she put it in the place. Where, and I sit back there, I'm marveling at that as a personality. Guess what? I ain't mad at nobody, because guess what? At the end of the day, Rochelle is where she wanted to be. And she don't have to go back and change it. That's, that's extra energy. <laughs> Just let them be in their personality, man. That's what the, okay, it's cool. You know? And she admits, that's the way I am, okay? So now, after 35 years, guess what? I've learned the way she is, Dot, so I just let her be who she is. <laughs> and she likes to do what? Most of the stuff because she likes to see it done a certain way. So that's how I communicate with her. That's how I keep her happy. <laughs> I let her do what she likes to do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, keep him happy, man. No, I keep Sam. No, I keep him happy, man. I mean, the first thing I can put up with that, you know. All right. But then he says, but then he says, if one falls down, his friend can help him up. If that what? If one falls down, a friend can do what? Pick him up. In a lot of different ways, spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially. You need, you need a friend. You need more than one friend, too. Okay? Yeah, your wife is your friend, I understand. But you need friends apart from the marriage relationship, okay? Because something, guess what? That you need to talk to another man about. Somebody you can trust. Okay? So, everybody needs what? Friends. So what? If you fall down physically, financially, emotionally, or spiritually, somebody can do what? Help pick you up. It's a sad occasion when you don't have anybody to do what? Come alongside you and say, girl, you need to get up from there. Or boy, you need to get up from there. You, you, you can do better than this. Okay? Or financially, hey, let me help you out. You just fell down. I know you're going you, you to make it. You, you have a delivery. Let me, let me help you. Let me put a little money in your pocket, okay? Emotionally, somebody can do what? You can talk to. Somebody can help you do what? Keep you from losing your mind or blowing your brains out. Okay? Physically, somebody to work out with. Me and Terrell used to walk together. I guess he done got a little older now. He don't, he don't walk together anymore. <laughs> yeah, Addie, we used to walk around the park. He used to come over to the house. And, it's the same job. He can't live on the job. He had the same job, you know. But I'm his friend, okay? Okay? 
we ride together. But we still what? We still together. Everybody needs somebody. Okay, that what? That they can do what? Come alongside of them and do what? Help them enjoy life. Look what else the verse says. Look what else it says. He says, verse 10, if one falls down, his, his, his friend can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Verse 11. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep one. Now, we're not talking about husband and wife. We're not talking about sex, okay? This is in the context of just traveling strangers. They're in the wilderness. They lie down together with their little, uh, what they call them, sleeping bags, whatever the case may be, has a tendency of doing what? Being together to keep each other warm. This is not a uh, sex Okay, context. This is the context of what two people, okay, two warm body people that can do what can come together and lie down together, okay. Uh, and then we see what it says, uh, verse 12 though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. If you got a friend, if somebody come up against you from a standpoint of scandal, you have somebody speak up for you, right? There's a lot, a lot of things practical we can use this for, okay? If somebody says, Terrell's a rat. I'm Terrell's friend now. I know Terrell. He's not a rat, okay? He's not, he's not perfect, okay? <laughs> but I know him, okay? You need, support, you need an advocate. You need somebody to, what, to speak up for you when you can't speak up for yourself, okay? Got it, okay? Everybody needs what? Somebody to do it, be able to speak for them when they can't speak for themselves, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. You get overpowered. Somebody needs to be, what, there to defend you. Even in a fight, in a fight, too, physically, okay? You need some help. Now, I remember, Delaney, when I was in the Air Force, we was crazy. I was stupid back in that day, man. <laughs> and uh, if you were in the squadron, the 586 Missile Maintenance Squadron, we didn't care who started the fight. Guess what? All we got to do is say, Urban Glover is in 586 Mills Main Street. He's at the bar down there. They got a fight going on. We need to, guess what? The whole squad will turn out. We go down there to do what? Am I right, Irving? We go down to do what? Defend Irving. Because one thing about it in the service, guess what? You better be friends with each other because you were somewhere where you didn't know nobody. You was always in a different city, a different country, and you had to do what? Stick with each other. Matter of fact, some of my best friendship was forged when I was in the Air Force. Right or wrong, guess what? We stuck together with each other. That's what this passage of scripture is talking about. You need somebody to defend you. Then it says, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. In other words, three friends are better than two. Because they have strength in numbers. Because one of your friends may do what? May be a little soft. Okay? But the other two friends said, no, Sam, we ain't going to let you get away with that. Uh-uh. That's wrong. We're going to hold you accountable, okay? So the more friends you have, guess what? The more accountability partners that you have and the more joy you're going to have out of life because guess what? You got folk around you ain't going to let you just do anything that you want to do. Listen, a friend will do what? Call you out. If a person don't call you out, he's not your friend. Now, the Bible, fact, the Bible does what? Declare that, Okay? It's better to open wound than a what? A kiss on the lips. It's better for me to do what? Wound Delaney by telling him the truth. Say, man, you're wrong. You need to go get your act together. And he get mad at me rather than kiss him. So, oh, Delaney, man, you know, we buddies, man. You okay? No, I'm not doing Delaney any favors. He think he's okay. Sometimes people do things they think they're doing the right thing. And they're not. And somebody has to come alongside and say, man, that's wrong. You need some friends to do what? Come alongside of you and say, that is not right, Mac. You need to get your act together. Okay? We're done. We'll stop right there. Uh, we won't do our invitation.